Please note that in today's call, forward-looking statements may be made. All statements other than statements of historical facts may be forward-looking statements. Such statements may involve known and unknown risk and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those included in the statements. Such risks and uncertainties are discussed in the interim report, third quarter 2018, and also in Ahold Deleuze public filings and other disclosures. Ahold Deleuze disclosures are available on aholddeleuze.com. Forward-looking statements reflect the current views of Ahold Deleuze management and assumptions based on information currently available to Ahold Deleuze management. Forward-looking statements speak only as of the day they are made, and Ahold Deleuze does not assume any obligation to update such statements, except as required by law. The introduction will be followed by a Q&A session. Any views expressed by those asking questions are not necessarily the views of Ahold Deleuze. At this time, I would like to hand over the call to Mr. Henk Jan ten Brinke, Senior Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our third quarter 2018 results conference call and audio webcast. I'm here with Franz Müller, our CEO, and Jeff Carr, our CFO. After a brief presentation, we will be happy to take your questions. So with that, over to you, Franz. Thank you very much, uh, Hank Jan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and welcome to our third quarter 200, 2018 results conference call. I'm pleased with these results as we delivered strong sales and earnings growth, which has allows uh, us to increase our free cash flow guidance for the year. This underscores the strength of our great local brands and our leading positions on both sides of the Atlantic. The third quarter sales rose 3.6% at constant rates. U.S. comparable sales was up 3% and excluding the hurricane Florence impact up 2.5% and we saw positive volume growth in the U.S. this quarter. Net consumer online sales were up 27.6%, boosted by another very strong quarter for Vol.com. This puts us firmly on track to realize at least $5 billion in net consumer online sales by 2020, and thus exceeding our target. Our underlying operating margin increased 20 basis points to 4.1%, supported by synergies. Net income was up 26% to 459 million euros as a result of higher operating income and lower income taxes. Free cash flow continues to be very strong and we expect free cash flow for the year to be at least 2 billion euros exceeding our previous guidance. We are looking forward to give you an update on our strategy at the Capital Markets Day on November the 13th, next week's Tuesday in New York City. We are excited to share our plans on e-commerce and digital in both the US and Europe and on the repositioning program at Stop and Shop, along with further plans to drive growth in the years ahead as we continue the expansion of the leading position of our great local brands. Now, let me head over to Jeff who will take you through the numbers in greater detail. Uh, thank you, Franz, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as Franz mentioned, uh, net sales at 15.8 billion euros are up 3.6% at constant rates. And while we saw a strong performance in the US and the Netherlands, particularly at Foodline and Ball, it was, very, it was a very good overall performance from all of our brands. Underlying operating margin at 4.1% uh, was a 20 basis points improvement versus last year. With operating income, underlying operating income at 647 million uh, up, uh, euros, up 8.8% at constant rates. And as Franz mentioned, uh, lower merger-related costs and lower taxes resulted in impressive growth in, in net income. Net income from co op, uh, continuing operations uh, being up 30.6% to 475 million euros. In the US, we saw a strong top line performance with volume growth. And while food line was, as I mentioned, particularly impressive as we continue to roll out the easy, fresh, affordable format, we also saw positive trends across all our US brands. 
Total net sales grew 3.2% to 9.6 billion euros, and comparable sales were at 3.0%. As we've mentioned in the quarter, the Carolinas were impacted by Hurricane Florence, and I'd like to add my thanks to the hard work of our associates who responded fantastically to ensure that as many of our stores as possible remained available during the crisis to serve our customers. The impact from the hurricane was estimated at a positive 0.5 percentage points on the comparable sales for the segment. So adjusted, comparable sales would have been 2.5%, representing a strong improvement in the trend from Q2. The margin impact of the hurricane was fairly neutral, uh, since the extra benefit from the sales was offset by a $10 million one-time cost, which was included in underlying operating income. Underlying operating income therefore grew in the U.S. by 8.8% to 395 million euros, and margins were up 20 basis points to 4.1%. There's also a strong quarter in the Netherlands with sales of 3.5 billion euros, so comparable sales grew by 5.9%. Net consumer sales grew by 33% uh, in the quarter. And if you exclude the impact of Ball.com, comparable sales for the Netherlands, less excluding Ball, grew by 4.2%, still an impressive growth rate. Underlying operating margins were 5.1% in the quarter, up 20 basis points again compared to last year. And again, excluding Ball.com, underlying operating margin was 5.7%, also up at 20 basis points. We continue to see steady progress in Belgium, and although comparable sales were only up 0.6%, this was significantly impacted by having fewer trading days in the quarter. If we adjust for this, the comparable sales would have been at around 2%. Underlying operating margin of 3.2% was up 20 basis points versus last year, mainly due to higher gross margin and the ongoing delivery of the synergies. In Central and Southeastern Europe, net sales were 1.5 billion euros, up 3% at constant rates. That's largely due to the addition of 123 new stores year-on-year, year, most of which were smaller convenience formats. Comparable sales were at 0.6%, uh, where we see a strong performance in Romania and the Czech Republic, but with a softer performance in Greece. Albeit, we are now seeing improving sales trends in Greece, and we expect a better fourth quarter. Underlying operating margin at 3.7% was down 60 basis points, partly due to the sales deleverage due to what we see in Greece, but also to the higher labor inflation we see across the region. As Franz mentioned, free cash flow remains very strong, with 538 million euros in the quarter. That's 26% ahead of last year. And year to date, our free cash flow now stands at 1.7 billion euros, 64% higher than last year. We announced today that free cash flow for the full year would be at least 2 billion euros in 2018. And that's ahead of our previous guidance of 1.9 billion. The improvement in free cash flow is being driven not, not only by the improved operating cash flow, but by continued strong working capital performance and the fact that we now expect capital expenditure to be slightly lower for the full year at 1.8 billion. Now, finally, as I wrap up, uh, we remain on track to deliver 420 million euros of net synergies by the end of 2018, with 113 million euros in the third quarter, an increase of 45 million versus last year. And one-time merger-related costs remain within the original targets of 380 and 70 million, respectively. Now, let me uh, hand back to Franz. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Um, on slide 13, um, as part of our strategy, we continue to invest in our store network, inspiring customers with new store formats. And let me give you just a few recent examples. In Belgium, the last remote the first five stores based on the new format. A highlight of the new concept the store in Nivelle is the Fresh Atelier, offering freshly prepared, ready-to-eat meals using recipes for a healthy diet. In the Czech Republic, Albert, has created a new concept for urban supermarkets featuring fresh, healthy foods and a fast and easy shopping experience with many products from local suppliers. In the US, Stop and Shop remodeled all its stores in the Hartford area, 20 of them, 
as the first phase of its repositioning program, delivering more fresh, fast, local and healthy options. And we will tell you more about this next week on Tuesday. Food Lion continued to roll out the successful easy, fresh and affordable format to 712 of its 1,029 stores, including 168 stores in the Norfolk and Great Roanoke market this year. As part of our omni-channel strategy, we also continue to develop and expand our e-commerce and digital plans and programs throughout the business. And let me also give you a few examples here. Albert Hain to go has started to roll out tap and go. Check out free stores that offer customers super fast shopping without waiting in line. And by using blockchain technology, Albert Hain has taken the next step in offering transparency in the product production chain of its own brand products for its customers. Food Lion introduced the Food Lion to go grocery pickup service in North Carolina and Virginia, allowing customers to order and pick up their groceries in as little as one hour. Bowl.com is now piloting extra fast delivering with home delivery within two hours of ordering and with electric bicycles in an environmental friendly way. On page 15, you see, um, before we start the Q&A session, let me briefly wrap up. We had a successful quarter with sales growth across the board and strong growth of underlying operating income and net income. Based on our strong cash generation, we expect free cash flow for 2018 to be at least 2 billion euros, exceeding our previous guidance of 1.9. And as I, state, as I said in the beginning, we are looking forward to providing an update on our strategy at the Capital Markets Day on November the 13th, next week, Tuesday, in New York City. So let me hand back to the operator and to start the Q&A session. Ladies and gentlemen, to be registered for the question and answer queue, please press star 1. To remove a question, please press star 2. When asking your questions, be aware that everyone on the call can hear background noise. So please keep this to a minimum. If possible, don't call N3 or use the speaker. In order to allow enough airtime for all participants, we would like you to limit the number of questions to three. Please stand by for a moment as we wait for participants to register for the queue. Thank you. The first question comes from Mr. Nick Coulter, City. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Um, so three from if, if I if I may. Uh, firstly, on the U.S., as you look uh, between the sequential quarters, the second quarter and the third quarter, uh, and remove the distortions of Easter and the hurricane impacts, and also a move in inflation, what what has changed? Is it uh, the promotional execution of stop and shop uh, that has improved? Is that the biggest step factor? Uh, or are there um, underlying shifts at the other other banners? Uh, that would be the first question. Thank you. Hi, Nick. Um, yeah, certainly it's an improving trend if you adjust for Easter and still adjust out the hurricane. I think inflation is, is pretty flat across the U.S. from quarter two to quarter three at around 1.6% um, in, in our markets. Um, I think certainly we we talked about and what we mentioned in the uh, in the script was that we saw improvements across all the brands, but certainly um, across the former Ahold brands, where we talked about especially stop and shops uh, standing up the brands in in quarter one and quarter two, we have seen an improved performance through better execution of the promotional activities, and that's one of the things uh, that we flagged in August, and and that has certainly come through in quarter three, but we continue to see very strong performances, even adjusting for the hurricane uh, down at food line. Uh, that continues to, you know, with the rollout of easy, fresh and affordable, we've continued to see a very strong uh, improvement in terms of volumes and market share delivery. And again, at Hannaford in the north, um, we see very uh, good performance. So I'd say across all of the brands, uh, particularly at the AUSA brands, which is more operational improvement in terms of better execution, promotional activity as we stood up the brands. Um, 
and but we do see an improvement in the overall trends also at Foodline and uh, and Hannaford. So I don't think um, it's really inflation driven since inflation is pretty flat. Uh, but we are seeing underlying uh, strong volume growth, and, and that's very pleasing in the in the third quarter. So it's, it's across the board, but, but stop and shop is probably the biggest step change within within the mix. Um, I, I don't know if it's the biggest. It, it, it's certainly, um, I, I think, the delta between Q2 uh, and Q3 is 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 a bit stronger at stop and shop for sure. Um, but we did see, as I said, a, an improvement across the board. And although we're not proud of the 12% in an online necessarily, we've got a lot more to do, and we'll talk about that at the Capital Markets Day. You know, it was also positive to see uh, online performing a little better, which, uh, again, we'll talk about more uh, at the Capital Markets Day. So it really was across the board we saw improvements. Great, thank you. And on online, just on the new automated wear rooms for stop and shop, and, and without stealing next week's thunder, because I'm sure you'll, you'll cover it in greater detail, but... For those new automated wear rooms, how many lines can they stock and will they be used to pick uh, fresh and chilled? Thank you. Yeah, uh, Nick, uh, Franz here. I think we uh, we talk about this uh, next week, Tuesday, at the CMD, where we uh, both highlight uh, uh, all kinds of fulfillment options and technology uh, for our European markets and especially also the, the strong uh, experience and learnings at Ball and at uh, aha.nl. And at the same time, we also will give you an, a good uh, preview of how we would like to operate our business in the U.S. And I think one key word is we th we see um, our retail business with the great local brands as local brands uh, close to customers. And that's why you also will see uh, the partner choice we're going to make. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then lastly, on, on CapEx, if I may, with respect to the lower guidance. How should we think about that for, for, for this year? Obviously, there will be impact in, in the outer years, but, but for this year and the lower guidance, is, is that a timing impact? Yeah, it is just timing, uh, Nick. I mean, you know, you est make estimates at the beginning of the year, but there's a lot of regul regulatory hurdles you have to get through to open up the number of stores that you'd like, and uh, we still have a lot of openings due in Q4. Uh, so we have a lot of spend, a real step up in spend in, in the fourth quarter. Um, but based on some timing of, of in various countries, uh, we've slightly downgraded from 1.9 to, to 1.8. Uh, we don't constrain the capital uh, within the business. Uh, there's no benefit in doing that. We have strong free cash flow. I'd rather we spent the 1.9. We get good returns on all of those investments in new formats and such forth. But it's just down to, to pure timing in terms of uh, the teams are just a bit behind their, their spend rates. Very helpful. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Mr. Robert Janvos, IBM AMRO. Go ahead, please. Yes, hi. Good morning. A couple of questions. Um, I remember that last year at Q3 you announced your uh, share buyback program that, that is currently running. The program is now uh, for more than 90% done, so my first question would be, uh, when will you take a decision on a potentially new buyback program? Uh, then uh, the second question, you, you already mentioned the food inflation in the U.S. Can you also share the food inflation in Netherlands and Belgium, please? And um, yeah, maybe also on the CAPEX, um, you explained it's, it's a timing issue for this year. But for the midterm, uh, do you still believe that the current CAPEX as percentage of sales of around 3% uh, is, is, a, is a run rate uh, and sufficient? Um, and lastly, Netherlands, 4.2% uh, excluding ball. I assume you increased your market share in the Netherlands in the quarter. Can you, uh, can you say something on that, please? Thank you. Yep. Um, Robert John, a few things. Uh, on the buyback, we will be very explicit on our financial structure and plans next week at the CMD. Uh, uh, on the food inflation in the Dutch market, food inflation is around 2%, and for Belgium, roughly about 2.9%. Uh, and uh, the capex levels of 3% uh, are levels where we feel very comfortable with, uh, but having that in mind, that is uh, overall higher than most of our competitors do. So it's, uh, it's an, a strong figure. 
Uh, but having said that, also uh, you know that we have a very strong, strong financial structure and culture. So uh, we'll be very disciplined in spending our capex. Uh, but uh, if there are opportunities we shouldn't miss uh, based on our rosy hurdles, then uh, we have the firepower to do so. But three percent is the number we uh, we believe in. Uh, that's a good number, and that's above market. And, and maybe a comment on the market share in the Netherlands. Um, we, we saw um, that the market share in the in, in the second quarter um, was under pressure, uh, and we don't have uh, the market share numbers uh, for the full third third quarter yet. Okay, thanks a lot. The next question comes from Mr. Andrew Porches, HSBC. Go ahead, please. Uh, hi guys, um, quite a good set of numbers. Um, just a couple from me, if I if I could do. Just in terms of stop and shop, obviously that was the main sort of area of, of disappointment last quarter. Um, you talked about uh, the, the amount of change in that business from the from, from the local brand proposition. Do you think you're fully up to speed there yet, or are you still seeing an improving trajectory in terms of execution? Can we you know look forward to, to better performances there going forward? And then just a quick one on the um, Hartford transformations. Um, I appreciate you're going to give us a lot more detail next week, but should we be thinking about these in the context of easy, fresh, and affordable, um, or are they much bigger? I mean, the three and a half million of capex per site seems like it's a, it's a much bigger transformation on a on a store by store basis than easy, fresh, and affordable. Uh, and then the last one, just if I can do, um, are you, are we, should we expect easy, fresh, and affordable capex to taper as you get closer to the end of that program um, from from next year, or is there still a couple of years to go on that? Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Jeff and myself will try to answer your, your questions together here. Uh, on Hartford, um, the first 20 stores uh, uh, are done in the Hartford, Connecticut area, um, and the first feedback of customers uh, is uh, very positive. Um, uh, the investments are higher um, compared to the average uh, for easy, fresh, and affordable food line, but don't forget the stores are also much bigger. So it's, uh, we, sh we should compare them in a different way. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, Capital Markets Day next week, um, we talk about uh, more details and more insights uh, on what our plan is for the total stop and shop uh, uh, business and brand. Um, in stop and shop, in general, um, we see very good opportunities uh, to to raise the strength in the sales of, the, of that brand, um, especially because we have excellent locations and we have highly um, highly energized teams there. And of course, uh, repositioning and remodeling, and um, and also working on the online side and um, and uh, equipping those stores also with a stronger online proposition will be a big help. Easy, fresh, and affordable. 700 stores out out of a roughly thousand. Um, we have uh, for the 2019 year another batch uh, planned. So we we're coming to the end of that remodeling scheme, and that's why we also can uh, switch a capex from that program into, for example, the capex of a stop and shop program. Yeah, I, I, Andrew, it's Jeff. I just I just follow up on Stop and Shop by saying, look, we we talk specifically about the standing up of the new commercial uh, merchandising marketing teams in Q1 and Q2, and then the handover of the planning for the promotional activities and the marketing activities, and that's largely done. Uh, the team's now very much focused on um, the transformation of Stop and Shop. We're all very excited about that. It's rightly being pointed out as one of our weaker, relative weaker areas in terms of the growth profile over the last couple of years. And so we're very excited to be able to uh, address that and, and we'll give more uh, in the Capital Markets Day. But I, I would say that, that that handover of the specific activities and, and the bedding in of that was, was pretty much complete during the second quarter, as we said then, and, and we've seen better results as a, as a consequence of that in the third quarter. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. The next question comes from Mr. Fabien Caron. Kepler, go ahead, please. Indeed, it looks as if your own stores uh, continue to underperform uh, compared to Fabienne, the... Fabien, uh, 
Fabienne, we, I think we missed the first beginning of your question. Ah, you okay, sorry, the sorry. Yeah. So, so first on Belgium, looking at the appendix, we see that the um, own stores continue to underperform the franchisee. Could you comment on that? The second question is more broad on uh, logistic costs and the fact that we see some driver shortage, I guess, Belgium, uh, Holland, and as well the U.S., if you could quantify um, the impact of this increased cost uh, for you. And finally, on the U.S., um, I, there's always a lot of discussion regarding the price position of your different banners over there. Uh, can you make some comments? Are you comfortable with the price position of each banner or which banner do you think you may have more work to do? Thank you. Uh, Fabian, I tried to, try to answer question one and three and Jeff uh, might focus on the number two. Uh, on Belgium, two things on Belgium. You see a an, an positive uh, uh, sales growth of 0.6%, uh, but we also realize that we have uh, one Sunday more in the quarter, and the Sunday more in the quarter means for our company operated mm -hmm. store that we are closed. So uh, if you would uh, correct that, then uh, that is an effect of 1.5% negative in, in our case, and that same negative will be um, coming towards us uh, in a positive sense for the fourth quarter, because we have then uh, one Sunday less. Uh, so uh, comparable sales for Belgium are roughly 2%, uh, comparable sales up, that's one thing I would like to mention. The second thing is that um, uh, you, we should not forget that our um, company or operated stores are always closed on Sundays, whereby the affiliate stores the, uh, operated by third parties can be open on the Sundays. It has to do with legislation and CLA and unions uh, agreements. Uh, and that's a big difference, especially as the, the weekends in Belgium get uh, bigger, and especially also um, as uh, most of the smaller formats grow faster, and the smaller formats are all affiliate uh, formats, so they also have not only the smaller growth uh, format uh, opportunity, but also the Sunday opportunity. It's a little bit complicated to understand this, but it's the, that's the phenomenon in our Belgian business. Uh, on the U.S., um, uh, on the... On the pricing, I think we always were very uh, consistent there, uh, and both uh, and for food line, uh, we said for the image items, uh, they are within a range of one two percent uh, to a big box retailer in the U.S. And those image items are a good two and a half thousand items, and for the full um, for the full store wall to wall, we are ten percent away from the big box retailer as food line, and we also said that uh, to give us an indication for um, for the uh, one of the. Uh, other Aho the last brands uh, for Giant Martins that um, that looks very similar uh, towards uh, towards Walmart. So that's to give you some price indications. Um, we also uh, said already earlier that um, uh, we are going to reposition uh, Stop and Shop, and that will be in combination of a lot of new concepts and digital and produce and remodeling. But we also will do some meaningful meaningful uh, price investments in Stop and Shop as well. Okay. Jeff, can you take the second one? Well, on logistic costs, it's true, fair to say uh, we have across the board in, in Europe and the U.S. we see um, uh, somewhat shortages of drivers and some inflation. I think specifically in the U.S. we're seeing close to 10% inflation in logistic costs, which just makes it more important that we continue f to focus on our safe for our customer programs to offset those types of cost increases. Um, I don't have a number specifically for Belgium with me, but uh, in the U.S., it's, it's inflation of uh, our logistic costs in, in total is running at around uh, running just under 10 percent. And it's uh, based on logistic cost of uh, two to three percent of sales in the U.S. Yeah, I think it's uh, somewhat under two percent. I think uh, okay. yeah, just two two point two percent of, of sales in the U.S. Okay. Okay, thanks for That's that. Total L and D. It's logistics and distribution, so it's okay. it includes warehousing costs as well. I, I look at that line in combination. <coughs> okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Fabian. The next question comes from Mr. Ajay Soni Bernstein. Go ahead, please. Hi there. Um, is there any information you could provide on uh, the market share? Um, so, in the second quarter, you mentioned. All the bands in the U.S. were either flat or up. Um, has this changed in quarter three? Uh, and just the second one, um, removing the hurricane impact for this quarter, um, is this comparable sales level likely to continue in the U.S.? Thank you. Uh, I think I think Jeff, you already mentioned the, the hurricane effect, uh, the 50 basis points for the U.S., so a 3% comp sales for the total U.S., let's say, uh, taking the hurricane uh, uplifting sales out for the food line brand, it's a 2.5% comp sales for the U.S. 
Yeah, and I, I think the way we measure market share, we try to get the most uh, inclusive number, including uh, drug, dollar stores, club stores. But it, looking at it that way, it comes in uh, pretty much a quarter late. But what I'd say is that um, this type of improvement, we could expect to see uh, an improvement reflected in market share. I don't see a big change in the overall market uh, growth rates. So I've, I've got, and we'll talk a little bit more about market share next week, uh, specifically in reference to the U.S. Uh, brands. But I'm confident we continue to see uh, a positive trend in terms of market share as well, um, in in terms of the U.S. And and for the fourth quarter, you know, we've seen five weeks or so of the fourth quarter. I've, I've no reason to, to to be concerned that we don't see the positive trend continuing into the fourth quarter or, or certainly maintaining the, the sort of levels that we're looking at at the moment. Okay, thanks. The next question comes from Mr. Andrew Gwynn, Exxon. Go ahead, please. Uh, most of my questions have been covered off, but uh, two quick ones, if I can. So firstly, on the tax rate, um, pretty low this quarter, um, presumably still sticking to that low 20s guidance, but wondering if you could be a bit more specific as we've got a little bit more uh, further into the year. Uh, and then finally, um, just on the synergies number, obviously no change for this year, but obviously if you sort of think about other projects, and you mentioned logistics, for instance, I mean, the Two businesses are essentially uh, not integrated from a logistics point of view in the U.S. Um, is there a possibility that we get an extra logistics program, uh, extra synergy number? Sorry. Um, let me pick that up on the on the tax rate. It was low in the quarter, and you know, from time to time, we get one-time uh, benefits of uh, various adjustments to um, provisions and such forth. We did in this quarter, excluding that, it would have, the rate this quarter would have been 20, just over 20 percent. Um, and I expect that, you know, we'll, you know, we'll be around the 20 percent for the full year, taking into account some of the one-time, small one-time benefits we've had this year, but around 20 percent. It might just be slightly under 20 percent uh, for the full year. So clearly that's a significant uh, uh, benefit. Um, let me also follow up on, on the, the logistics. I, I think you're right to highlight that the synergies included um, uh, some of the areas that we were focused on and we addressed in the first two years of the merger, but there are clearly significant other areas of cost improvement and efficiency improvement that we'll continue to, to go after very strongly. We may call them safe for our customer instead of synergies. Um, and certainly, if they fall outside of the calendar, which is the end of the uh, first half of 2019, then they'll be termed safe for our customer. But we still see significant opportunities, and we'll talk more about safe for our customer targets uh, next week as well. Uh, but clearly, uh, you know, we're still optimistic. There's a lot of improvement and efficiency bringing these two great businesses together and also learning best practice from each other. And uh, there's still more that can be done. And uh, again, we'll talk about that next week. Uh, I would fully echo what, Je what Jeff is saying. I think in the synergy period, we uh, got a lot of uh, teams energized and trained about that potential, which will have a different definition name, say, for our customers uh, than we had uh, under the name synergies. But the teams are working very closely together. A lot of things are shared. So I think that sh sharing will go on, and that potential will still see that's why we also uh, see a, a quite a big potential also for the future in, in saving money to uh, to look for more funding. And, and, and friends, earlier you mentioned um, substantial uh, or a fairly meaningful move in prices at Stop and Shop. Do you think that there's enough uh, oxygen, as it were, within the Safer or Shopper program to fund that, or might we think about maybe some margin pressure going forward? Uh, I think it's, an, it's, it's a combination of uh, we have. Uh, uh, we have pricing, but we also have loyalty systems and promotions and couponing. We have, an, uh, you will see in, in the Hartford area, if you, if you take the visit there, uh, we have a very strong uh, uh, fresh produce uh, new proposition, which will create a lot of traffic. Uh, we uh, will upgrade and update our stores also in center store, self-checkouts, and the whole experience, the whole journey will improve a lot. And I think all those components together uh, will give us um, extra extra share and extra growth uh, for Stop and Shop, which has historically uh, great locations and very good teams. Okay, thanks so much. The next question comes from Mr. Sweetar Mahamkali Macquarie. Go ahead, please. 
Yeah. Hi. Um, good morning. Um, so th 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 three questions um, for me, please. I'm just picking up on the save for customer savings. Um, Jeff, are you able to give us an idea of run rate, say, this year or last year, how much uh, savings were generated from save for customer in terms of run rate, uh, annualized run rate? That's the first one. Um, secondly, just uh, going back to the U.S., uh, I think first half volume was minus 0.6 from your presentation to Q2. Um, are you able to update on that volume in Q3, um, please? Um, and just finally, in, in terms of stop and shop, just two very quick questions. Um, who are you benchmarking your price positioning against? Uh, in stop and shop, and secondly, I, it's a few years since we've had a uh, breakout for uh, stop and shop in terms of revenues. I'm just trying to recollect probably around 12, 13 billion euros of revenues a while ago. Just curious to see how much of the U.S. business stop and shop now is. Please, thank you. Um, okay, on save for our customer, um, you know, we specifically took a decision not to distract from the synergies and give it uh, give a target for 16 and 17 uh, and 18 and and that was a decision based on the fact that we we weren't it wasn't that we weren't executing the regular safe for our customer programs which were not related to synergies and we had quite a strict definition if they were activities which resulted from bringing the two companies together and we got the benefits that would be a synergy but ongoing cost initiatives continued and we didn't give a target for those years because we felt we wanted to focus uh, people's mind uh, on the synergies. But I did talk about ranges of 0.5 to 1% of uh, sales being the kind of target that we should uh, look to deliver on an annualized basis. And we'll be much more specific next week with a specific target that we'll talk about uh, um, at the Capital Markets Day. Uh, in terms of the volumes, um, you know, we don't give volume numbers out, but we talked about 2.5% like-for-like sales and 1.6% inflation. So that, that's East Coast inflation, yeah. Our that was inflation. Our yeah. East Coast inflation, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think in the Q2 you have gave um, some volume numbers. I think you've included a mix in it, so I was just curious to see if there was a like-for-like -like number for Q3, that's all. Yeah, no, I um, we specifically broke that out because there was a lot of questions, but sure. um, around it, and there was a lot of factors impacting uh, the movements from Q1 to Q2. Um, but no, I think you know, in terms of the numbers, we've been quite clear: 2.5 adjusted for the hurricane and inflation of 1.6. So, so positive volumes overall. And the stop and shop. Um, the question was the size of stop and shop, or yeah, and also who are you benchmarking the pricing against? Uh, because you've well, referred to some price investment. I think on stop and shop, you know, that mark in that market, the discounters account for less than five percent of market share. You know, Walmart, for example, for the last twenty-five years, has has not been very successful coming into the New York, Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts market. Then op opening new stores. Uh, in that market, um, and therefore their market share and the market share of Aldi and Lidl remains very, very low. So we tend to benchmark against the other key supermarket players and the price leaders, you know, in the Massachusetts market, you, you look at someone like Market Basket, but it varies from region to region. And then you look at, for example, a ShopRite in uh, New York. But again, if you go onto Long Island or somewhere uh, into different regions, we have different pricing zones. Um, what I'd say is Stop and Shop has always been mid-priced in the supermarket uh, categories in those markets. So, for example, uh, we're lower priced than Shores in, in, in Massachusetts, but slightly higher priced than Market Basket. And you could say the same in Connecticut versus we're lower priced than Acme, but slightly higher priced than uh, uh, ShopRite. And, and that's the, the way we look at it, and it's done in a local market uh, pricing zone by pricing zone. And there's, I don't know how many pricing zones we have at Stop and Shop, but it's quite a few. And the relative uh, contribution of Stop and Shop to U.S. revenues? Um, I think it's, um, it's, it's probably uh, around uh, the U.S. Um, 23% or something? Yeah, just less than 20, between 20 and 25% of the U.S. revenues. Yep. 
the biggest brand we have in the U.S. The biggest brand. It's uh, Food Lion's the second biggest in terms of sales. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Mr. Dusan Milosavljic, Birnberg. Go ahead, please. Um, good morning. Uh, just uh, three questions for me, really. One of the the first one is about the insurance gains. Um, these are now kind of two to three percent of our EBIT. So I was just wondering how we should think about modeling this for next year and going forward. Um, they have been an incremental tailwind, I guess, this year relative to the previous year. Um, the second, the second question is just in respect to the, um, um, the commentary in the in the in the, the, in the press release you've given, you published in the beginning of of October. Um, you've given three areas of investments that are going to be coming in this new refurb. So one of them is the capex investments of about. Three million, and then we've also been talking about, uh, um, sorry, the capex investments of about three million per store. Uh, the other ones are investment in headcount and investment in in prices. So, I guess the message at the moment is that all of this can be offset through the existing cost savings program, and as Food Lion, um, Food Lion capex drops down. Yeah, I do appreciate to that question. Uh, you're happily invited to our Capital Markets Day next week, where we'll be uh, very clear and explicit about uh, the Stop and Shop program, which components, how we look for funding uh, for the total company, and how are we going to potentially offset uh, present investments, easy, fresh, affordable, into Stop and Shop to have, an, uh, to have an, uh, a good capex number overall for the company. Yeah, and it's, but it's not a, uh, again, uh, Dusan, it's not a, a surprise that we've said you know that the around three percent of, of sales capex is higher than our peer group. It's we're investing more than our peer group, and we will uh, not have to increase this significantly we'll, in order to do the stop and shop work. So we've said that in the past, and we continue to say that on insurance. Um, but obviously, we'll break out a lot more next week. On insurance, you're right. The the, the key driver of that, you know, is the. Um, uh, the discount rate, and as the discount rates go up, um, we do see a benefit coming through from a, uh, from a, the lower discounting of the insurance provision. This quarter, that amounted year on year to about six million uh, euros. So we've got a small benefit this quarter, and I think we continue to see discount rates trend up, uh, and we'll expect to see. A similar, we, I, I would expect to see another slight favourable uh, number in the fourth quarter. You know, we have a couple of factors which are linked to increasing interest rates. The other one is this insurance provision is set monthly. It's not, but if, for example, on the U.S. on the Dutch pension plans, uh, we as we set, we we found a significant benefit in 2000. Uh, we, we we could have a significant benefit as we see interest rates in in Europe increase. If you remember back in 2013, we saw significant uh, increases in cost as discount rates came down. Um, and, and so there are a couple of areas of our P&L which are impacted by that. And can I just ask the, 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 the final question? The, just wanted to clarify in respect to a question from, uh, from our, one of my peers. The plus 1.6% number that you just mentioned, that's East Coast inflation. For the market, or is that your shelf inflation in line with the 1.6% that you reported in Q2? That's uh, food at home CPI inflation, which is um, uh, close to what we reported as 1.6% last quarter, and we haven't significantly changed. So it's a good proxy for our own inflation. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from Mr. Dan Eckstein, UBS. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Good morning, um, everyone. Um, a couple of questions from me. Um, first one is on um, wage inflation in the U.S. Um, and Target has committed to $15 per hour, and Amazon recently um, committed to um, $15 as well. Could you tell me how that compares to your average hourly rate? Um, and whether you would see sort of convergence towards those peers over the next couple of years. Um, 
And then the second question is really on, on margins in, in the U.S. You've obviously delivered strong sales growth in the quarter. Um, on top of that, you know you're benefiting from, um, uh, I guess, quite significant savings. I think you said there are about $100 million this year from the retail business services um, implementation. Um, but if you, if you X out the synergy gains, then underlying margins are still down year over year. Um, so what, what's the kind of the missing part of the equation there? Is it, is it cost inflation? Is there something to do with the, the mix of sales? I wonder if you could just give a bit more color there. Thank you. Should I take the wage inflation, Jeff, and you the synergy piece? Is it okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. On the wage inflation, um, uh, we see, of course, the, the minimum wages set on federal, on state, and sometimes on municipality level. And we, of course, completely uh, com uh, compliant with the legislation. Apart from legislation, we have our own ambition to make sure that we uh, pay according to market levels. And that's what, what, and that's what we do already uh, 130 to 150 years. Um, State by state is very different. Uh, the $15 Amazon, we should also see this in perspective because uh, it's not only wages, but it's also benefits and other things, which are for our associates very important. On the average wage, uh, you asked me, uh, you asked us here, on average uh, wages, our on average wages are most of them higher than the $15. Uh, the $15. Uh, partly uh, because we are, of course, also in a unionized environment on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, we would like to make sure that uh, that we have uh, good conditions for our for our associates. So we don't we do not see extra pressure coming out of this at the moment, uh, and that's what we also check on a regular basis uh, through our engagement levels with our people. And um, happily so, it's not only wages and benefits in the company; it's also uh, the working environment uh, and the level of inclusion. So um, that is a little bit on wages and wage inflation. So. Uh, convergence, uh, I think, is not necessary because we are on a daily basis uh, with those competitors in the market, also from an um, uh, employer reputation uh, as well, and we, we we think that we can compete very nicely. Okay, thanks. Um, but to answer your, your your second question, obviously, wages is one of those areas which where we see inflation increasing uh, higher than prices, and and. Uh, Therefore, we have to do everything we can in terms of our safe for our customer to offset that. But I think if you look at this quarter, you know, we delivered an incremental 56 million of underlying operating income, of which 45 million were incremental synergies. So, yes, we have seen some uh, slight uh, base margin erosion if you factor out the synergies. But relative to our peer group, I think we've held our, our base margins pretty well. I think two years after the merger, though, you, we, we don't spend so much time looking at a base and a margin with synergies and without synergies. We look at the overall delivery and look at how that's appropriate for the group based on the investments we need to make going forward. And, and really, if I look at 20 basis points margin improvement, uh, I think that's a great performance in, in this quarter. Um, it's, it's pretty much, um, you know, for the third third year, we've seen margin improvements uh, for the group, and so I, I'm I'm not overly hung up about the with synergies without synergy number. I think we have to look at the total the total picture. I, for example, saw some comparatives in in one of the analysts' report about the synergy levels that that we're generating and comparing it to other retail mergers, but we've actually shown some of those synergies shown real margin improvement, which again, it's easy to talk about synergies, but not actually drop the synergies to the bottom line. And, and we've been doing that. So I'm, I'm very proud of the 20 basis points margin improvement. And certainly two over two years now, nearly two and a half years after the merger, I think we have to start just looking at the absolute numbers and not thinking so much about with synergies and without synergies. It's too complex a situation. There's too many moving parts to be able to say where would we have been without the synergies. It's it's just not relevant anymore. Okay, thanks. So that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes this conference call and audio webcast. Thank you for being with us today, and we hope to see you next week in New York. Thanks. <laughs>